My name is Femina Metcalf. I'm the Chief Information Officer for the Department of Biodiversity Conservation and Attractions. And I've worked for the department for over 30 years. It used to be the Department of Forestry. It became the Department of Conservation and Land Management, Department of Parks and Wildlife, Department of Environment Regulation, um, Department of Environment Conservation. So we have had many names, but fundamentally we've been the same department for a long, long time. Uh, and the department that we are now looking after has looked after the lands and the reserves and the marine reserves across the state and everything that you all enjoy when you go and visit Kings Park, Rottnest Island, the zoo, we look after from a technology point of view. Um, so we do do many things. We are also re responsible for fire management on our lands. Uh, we're responsible for sites on our lands to making sure that we collect appropriate information to do scientific research. So our function is quite broad across the state. And yes, we are statewide. There's not one part of WA that we don't touch. And all our people are field-based people. So that's a good part of what we do in our department. Hi, I'm Helen Ensicat. Um, I've been working since April with the department. So I'm the manager of a quite new function in the department, um, which is the state's biodiversity information office. And um, have been involved in setting that up, which we'll be talking to you a bit later as a case study. Yep. Why? Um, we are focusing on open source. So as I said to you, my journey in the department started over 30 years ago as a very young officer. And my background is in GIS. My work that I was focused on is collating spatial information and modeling them. So that's my background. So now I'm a CIO, which is not conventional for a GIS person, but that's where my background is. So when in my early 20s, I worked for the same department and we have a very small GIS group and I have used all the vendor-based software that you can see on the market. Intergraph, Esri, uh, Erdas Imagine, every one of those products, but all of those locked in our data for many, many years and wouldn't allow us to interoperate. So as a model, I found that very restrictive. Now, in the old GIS area we had, there were a number of us that were pursuing the open source, open data pathway. This is in the 1980s. Right, we were pursuing that. And one of us stayed in the public sector, that was me, and the other one decided to go private enterprise, that was Piers Higgs, <laughs> okay? And we pursued the pathway since then as well. Now, the reason for me to stay and, and, and do this work was because I found that um, for many years, the things that I worked on really was not allowing us as public service to do what public service should do, which is to do work for the community and share information with the community so they can do better research and make better decisions. So the work that I pursued to do from that point on was say, how do we now start opening this up? It was one person, just me. And from there, we started to work on building systems, right? Fire, um, fire modeling system that I built in Esri was locked down, so I said, I'm going to use QGIS. I'm going to use different, different systems. I'm going to use Postgres, PostGIS. So the first time that we started was a very critical system that we built in-house was the spatial support system, which was a vehicle tracking system to track where all the vehicles for fire management was in the state. We were the first to do it out of all the public sector agencies, and we were Department of Car. Right? Now, doing that, that system is still there today. And the team that I've got here now was just a small group of us, two or three of us. And now we have a team, right? So we're not a small group anymore. So that is where it came about because we wanted to say, we can't do open data without open source. That was the foundation that was driving me. That promise that I had when I was a young person also was driven by another story. There was an emergency incident that occurred in Victoria. A child died because St. John's Ambulance could not find him in, um, in a rural setting because the maps they were using in the Triple O Center was not the same as what was in the trucks. And Intergraph was a proprietary-based software, and the child died from asthma, and my son is a chronic asthmatic. And I just remember being in hospital every month, and I realized what that parent would have had to go through for not having the same information. So from that point, I decided no information is going to be locked in and it has to be made available for emergency services 
uh, it's tough to use, sorry, I'm emotional, sorry about that. But that was how it started. It's that um, the need for us to have information open and have it available. So that journey started and we started doing a lot of mapping in that area. Um, but now today, I'm in a position as a CIO to drive that reform further. So um, that's the story of why we are pushing open source, open data. And I think we have come a long way and I think we have made good traction. Yeah. So, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I've got involved in this as well and why I'm standing up here today. So I don't come from a tech background at all. I come from a finance and economic modelling um, background. But when I entered the public service many years ago, I landed in a very small agency that does independent inquiries into really difficult issues that the government wants advice on. And sometimes they were really weighty, like the way we run our prisons, or really contentious, like energy pricing. Occasionally they were really hilarious, like Tony Galati versus potato regulation by the government. So we gave many, many recommendations on these things, and they were all targeted on the topic, except for one thing. In almost every case and every inquiry we did, one of the recommendations we made to government was that we needed to be more open to release data to publish information about government and the way we make decisions. And that was absolutely consistent across everything that we did over the years. So that pattern is actually what led me to getting involved with the fledgling open data movement in WA. So I was involved in drafting the very first whole of government open data policy with a few of the people who are in the room today. And that was a really wild new idea then, to go to agencies with this idea of open by default, when everything was quite the opposite. And from that, actually convincing agencies to put data on this really fledgling data.wa site that really didn't have very much, and convincing them to come along to events like GovHack and say, no, there are people in this room who want to use your data, you have no idea. So through this journey, I learned a lot about why data sharing is the right thing to do. So the value of open data, it's data's magnified in value by reuse. And there are evaluations that have been done around this in the last decade that say the value of reusing government data is in literally in the billions of dollars per year. One of the important things to me too is all that data is collected using government funds. So it is our data if there's no safety reason to restrict it. And most importantly, it also creates a lot of transparency around decision making. So it's, a real, it's been a real critical shift in how our sector is starting to think. It's become an invitation to people outside of government to actually collaborate with us, to argue for change with the backing of real evidence when they lobby that we are releasing. It's to use the data to create applications that augment the services that we're providing as a government. And it's also about people out there who can do some really cool visualisations and help people who uh, overcome barriers to visualising and understanding information that the government releases. So through this I realised that we started with the concept of open data, but it's actually not just about data, it's about openness more broadly. Um, so this includes obviously opening up code that we're talking to you today about, um, open learning, open information about what we do in our processes. But out of this, I think the reason that I'm here today is because I really believe that if you think the governments and public servants should be working collaboratively with citizens, then you can't actually get to that point without prioritising openness. So it's fine for us to have our stories, but what have we done about it? Personally, what have we done about it? Well, as the CI of the department, and the team that I have who are all in this group here, we have pursued to come up with strategies for the department that focus on openness, open source, open architecture, open data, open networks. That is what, open and secure. That is what we have done. Our organization has benefited from that. We're not locked down. Um, if you have had opportunity to talk to the team that have come from our department, they will tell you the things that they have done. Now, with that open comes value to the business. When you have that full transparency, for a start, you don't get hacked as much as the proprietary software companies do get. Like, you know, we tend to have our systems, our, our source codes available so people can use them, they can grow from them. So they see that community benefit back. Um, so, and the public sector level, we have also focused on, as um, Helen said, on open data policy. But we are also looking at how we can put an open source, because we use GitHub, an open source platform so everyone can contribute like we contribute and share it. So startups can use it. So that's the kind of direction we are working. We are working with the 
uh, the Department of Premier and Cabinet, Office of Digital Government, to pursue that pathway as well. So it's not just as us as an organisation, we are also looking at how we do it across the public sector. Yes, we could be only one agency that's doing it, but all it takes is one. And that's why we are here today to encourage everyone who is in this space to not give up and work with us to get to that point of openness across the public sector of WA. So as I mentioned, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the project that I'm working on at the moment, which is a uh, good example of some of the things we're doing in the open source space. As part of the Biodiversity Information Office's first two years, our main job is to build a whole of state platform to bring together biodiversity data in Western Australia. So by biodiversity data, so it's looking at observations of flora and fauna, where they occur, how they've been plotted over time, and um, important conservation regions and so forth. The reason we're doing this is because this has evolved differently in different states and for various reasons in WA we've ended up with our biodiversity data scattered across so many places. So it's set in our departments and various departments that don't necessarily connect with each other. Um, it's in research institutions, it's with big mining firms and frequently it's on the desktops of individuals who have nowhere to share it. But recently we've seen um, some funding come to our department to help change that and to bring that data together on a single platform. And the importance of that is similar to platforms like data.wa. If you don't know what's out there, you don't know you can use it. So this should help people search and discover and reuse the data as well. And the flow on from that is letting people make better policy decisions, better regulation around environmental approvals, doing research, and generally people who just want to understand the natural world around them in different ways as well. Because BIO is hosted by DBCA and because of the work that Femina's team has done in making this an open source agency, I've landed in a job where I have a unique opportunity to actually take an open source approach to this project. So we've been looking at the best solutions from elsewhere and how we can adapt and reuse them to our needs as well. So much work's already been done in this space. So there and through government investment and also through research institutions as well, there are already open source solutions for how to submit and ingest biodiversity data, pieces of software that are about quality controlling and curating it, mapping it to data standards. There's, as you would know, so much out there in terms of web mapping that we can draw on to present it to people and developing APIs around that. And also in embedding some of the functions that are unique to government, like this need for ongoing digital preservation to show our audit trail for making important decisions. So when we went out to work out how to build this, we didn't actually look to proprietary solutions because of our department's policy. We went looking for companies that could help us take those solutions from around Australia, in some cases around the world, and integrate them into modules of an open platform that worked for our department. And one of the really interesting things for me about this project, which really shows the value of open source, is that because we're supposed to work with the Commonwealth on this one, they're also building an integrated platform that will pull data in from all states, like our platform, and aggregate it at a national level with a pilot state for it and because we're doing this open source other states aren't necessarily looking to proprietary software for their work either um, they're also looking to what we're doing now and how they can reuse that so by building open with this project we're magnifying the value of the commonwealth's investment in our state as well but it doesn't only help out others um, internally it really helps our platform and our department be more resilient so it's a solution that we can enhance and sustain and refine in-house without ongoing management um, requirements. It's something that we can later engage a variety of vendors to work on to do open source development depending on their expertise. And it's a code base that we can collaborate broadly with others on, adapting their innovations as well. This is not the only project we're working on, Bio. There's another 14 to 18 other systems that we're building all in open source in our department. And the team that you see here, they are part of that to building it. So yeah, so it's not just one, we are, it's across the department. When we do build in-house, we build open source. From a driving at a broader a change of a whole government, it has been challenging. It's not been a simple journey. This is a 30-year journey for me. Um, it's been challenging because you would find to be in the role of a CIO, you are still the only one trying to support open source, open ecosystems. When vendors are out there marketing proprietary products like SAP, Oracle, things like that. Time has worked on our behalf because there was a time in the period, for, if you would know in the public sector, we've had these troughs and, and, and heights where the whole of government will outsource, then insource and outsource. So that whole time we insourced. We relied on our people, we kept our people, and we built our systems. And through this whole time that we have done that, 
we have not costed government great, um, we have not costed government investment hype. So which basically when you talk, what I talk about that is normally when a department wants a system, they'll say we need the system built, we need to go to Treasury, we need to get a lot of money for it. And then we get a vendor to build it. We've never had to do that because we've relied on open source and we've relied on our own people. The challenge has been though, is changing the mindset of everybody to see the value in it. Because we are still competing with vendors who want to hold that marketplace, what we call vendor lock-in. So that has been hard for us, but what we have done is we have pursued at a senior level um, communicating the benefits and it has been, in our organization it's understood it's quite important and valuable to be open source and to support open data. And it's trickling through. And I think in the Department of Premier and Cabinet we also have colleagues who really see the benefits of that. So I think the changes that we've been working towards is now taking a foothold which is a positive direction. What we now need, we are looking for uh, people who still, who want to now be working in that space and not work in .NET or Oracle or things like that. So, yeah. So as Femina said, she spent a lot of her career advocating for this at a really senior level. Um, but I can tell you that over my career, one thing I've learned is that change really does happen at all levels. Um, and the good ideas can take root at any level. So I've been part of driving this move towards openness as an analyst, as a policy officer, and now as a manager, as I've gone up through the public sector. Um, sometimes that's because I've been overt to the point, maybe some would say rude. Um, so I made a fuss and I talked my way onto the committee that wrote the whole of government open data policy because I really, really cared about that. And made a big fuss about it, managed to get myself on because some people listened to me. And if you look at the list of people in the credits for the first open data policy, it's a handful of big central agencies who are rightly in the place where one makes policy. And there's me from this agency you've never heard of with 70 people. And I had to apologise to my agency going, I know you don't make policy normally and I kind of got our name on this thing, but it was the right thing to do. Um, in the same vein, I've really pushed the philosophy of openness with the people that I've reported to, CAOs and directors, my managers, and even boards of various agencies I've worked at. Um, just making the case to these people that openness is a real option, it's not a warm and fuzzy thing that we talk about, it's something that's really practical, and getting that hard evidence in front of them that there are social benefits and economic benefits and performance benefits for an agency in adopting openness in terms of data and open source and other areas of their business. And likewise over the, actually Femina just mentioned it, um, over the last few months I've spent time uh, talking uh, with some hands-on stuff with our Premier and Cabinet about how we can make other agencies more engaged in sharing code and how we can do something like a code doubly way that would do the same for open source that's created in agencies that we've already done with data doubly way for open data. However, you don't actually need to be rude and noisy to make a change and I think that some people in previous talks have also referred to this. You can also do things quietly and make a difference. Um, I really feel that these values are things that, as a public servant, that you can and you should be embedding in your everyday business. So if I have staff who are looking at the vendors that they could recommend to their manager when we're going out to procure, look at open source vendors when you're doing that. Make it an option, make it visible. Get your agency code up on GitHub, your agency data on data.wa, the latter of which is becoming increasingly normalised across the sector. And you can set expectations that your colleagues and your peers in other agencies will do the same. So when you walk in and you say, oh, are you putting that up on GitHub? That immediately asks some questions at the other end and they have a conversation as well. So in short, I don't actually see that driving openness in the public sector is separate from my job or something that I do outside of it. It really is my day-to-day -day job. And that's a good point because um, in the public sector, if um, many of you aren't aware, there is a governance group in the public sector. There is a, what they call Director General ICT Council, and there is another group where they have selected CIOs and senior people to give direction on policy and strategy. And I have a seat on that board, on that group. So that is where you can see someone who's supporting and sponsoring open source as a CIO has a seat on that group to sponsor it in that forum as well. So yes, I think that the time for us has come for us to be able to take it further. So, this is a message for you. So what we have shared with you is our story of where we came from and where we are now. But what we now need is your help, all of you. 
we need you to understand the public service way of getting on board and joining us. If you have a business, please focus on getting yourself on the common use agreement. There's only one company at the moment that has put effort into that, which is Gaia, that is competitive enough to be on there. So we are asking you all, if you have a business and you are putting forward open source, get yourself on the common use agreement for ICT services. Because when you're on there, we can use your services. If you are a freelancer, get yourself onto the labor hire um, uh, common use agreement, talent. So we are, we are now looking for people. We can pick you up from there. Or look at WA job boards. We advertise and we are looking for open source developers. We're looking for project managers and business analysts that think open source. That's what we're doing. So we are, what we'd like to do is ask you all to pass on the fact that we as a department, DBCA, a small little department that looks after all the lands in the state, preserves and natural parks, we, we want to go open source and we need your help. 